Hello, friends. Good to see everybody. We're back again. It's teaching day. Teaching days are my favorite days. Is everybody wonderful out there? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, a lot of thumbs up. You all look so bright. And I have a sangha of shining people. People are going to say, how, do you, how can you tell Tenzin Tarpa Sangha? And they're going to say, oh, it's easy. It's the one that everybody's smiling, that the practice actually works. They're actually happy people. They're not in misery practicing. So today's exciting. We, uh, we're on part two of one of our big teachings. This is on the text, Patterns, Habits, and Free Will, and the Practice of Peeling the Onion. And uh, today we're looking at the practice aspect of this, which is the practice of peeling the onion part. We did um, Patterns, Habits, and Free Wills last time, which is on our YouTube channel, if anybody wants to go and see that one. Of course, this is part of my Skillful Living series, because we want to live skillfully and we want to live happily. Why don't we start with a prayer, huh? Our community prayer. Today, I feel fortunate to sit as a member of this kind community in the safety and security of like-minded friends, sharing this present moment with others dedicated to the cultivation of goodness. Today, I'm grateful for the direction and support that this community provides, a community worthy of my time and commitment, a community where my efforts have meaning, purpose, and are appreciated. Today, I'm thankful for this community of awakening, a place to gain the knowledge and skill to improve my life, a family, a home, and a sanctuary for all of us seeking refuge from the storm. And that's me. I'm looking for a little refuge from the storm, as we all are. And, of course, the storm is, the storm is samsara, the storm of samsara. So I hope everybody enjoyed the text and you had some time to think about what we talked about in our last wonderful session. Um, before I start, let's calm ourselves down with a little three breath meditation. We love that. Karen just wrote me a lovely letter saying, thank God for that darn three breath meditation. It's the only thing that stops me from killing my children. So let's, uh, I'll just murder them if I don't do my three breath meditation. So let's do our three breath meditation. And if I'm not thinking about a practice, I usually would say the mantra, present, aware, and content. Present on the inhale, aware at the top of the breath, and on the exhale, I say the word content. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's take a nice deep breath in. Present, say aware, and on the out, out breath, content. Let's go into our second breath. And our third breath. Oh, I'm ready to teach now. That's, <laughs> that's what I needed. I did that for me. I was talking to Stephen the other day, and he was joking. He said, uh, you know, every teaching, I try to stay present. I say, I'm going to stay present through the whole teaching. And I said, how does it go? And he says, I last about three minutes. And I said, same here. When you teach, you start, you, you're, you're kind of worried about the presentation. So it's hard to be present. But, you know, the ideas really try to be. Okay. So uh, this practice of peeling the onion, onion might sound familiar to some of you who have studied mindfulness uh, practice because um, it's relatively the same thing. Uh, peeling, uh, in my case, I have a text... Uh, we started with two texts in our curriculum, which is meditation basics and mindfulness basics. Um, mindfulness basics is, as the title states, an introduction to mindfulness. I, I, uh, I share the practice in a simple way, but peeling the onion is kind of an advanced form of mindfulness. But don't be mistaken, it really is simply mindfulness practice. We're just packaging it here for sale, you know, just making it sound fancier for everyone. But the idea is the same, we're, that we're using introspection and we're using uh, a form, this is a form of philosophical deconstruction. 
where we take something and we kind of look at it and try to investigate it and see what it is. So the whole idea of peeling the onion is keep peeling away layer upon layer of untruth and unproductive habits and things we don't necessarily like. And we just keep peeling the stuff away until we get to the juicy middle part. And in our, our onions are filled with chocolate in the middle. So we're, <laughs> we're trying to get to the chocolate. So that's the idea of peeling the onion. The term's used in just all the Buddhist traditions, but between you and me, I've never seen anybody that actually made a practice of it. So I did this of, uh, from a request of a monk friend who uh, liked teaching it, but he said, uh, you know, there's really no, no outline practice for peeling the onion. He asked me if I would uh, write something. I did, and I, put, I made it into this text, him and his friends are using it, and uh, I thought I would share it with you guys. So, um, uh, in some ways, uh, peeling the onion is kind of the same thing you do at a therapist if you went to, to, to do a little therapy. The idea of just slowly looking behind things and trying to figure out why you do things, and it's quite a fascinating thing. I think um, some people do it naturally. I think I've always been kind of an onion peeler. I'm always kind of introspective, looking at the things that I do and, and trying to figure out why and improve myself. Ultimately, that's the, that's the end result of this, that through understanding and getting insight into ourselves, we gain more control of ourselves, understand ourselves, which equals freedom, right? The quality that we're looking for, we're looking for mental freedom. So that's the goal that we're shooting for. Um, what's important in this practice? So last week we, we talked about patterns and habits and free will, and that was the, the wisdom or study aspect of it. But here what's exciting is we get into the experiential. It's not just being able to sit in a chair and kind of pick yourself apart. It needs to be deeper than that. You need to embody the quality. It needs to be experiential, where you're feeling the emotions. You really see what you're doing. So if you notice in all of our classes, there's a wisdom aspect or a study aspect and a practice aspect. The idea of that is to embody everything that we're learning. So like when I was in philosophy, Western philosophy, it was wonderful, but you never get to a point where there's something to practice. It's always conceptual and you come to an understanding of something, but there's never a mechanism for actually bringing it, in, bringing it into your life and benefiting your life. This is why I love Buddhism. Buddhism has the method, all the, all the ways to actually improve your life with it. So. That's what this practice is about, learning about ourselves and improving our lives. So what are some of the things that we peel away? So we're peeling away all kinds of stuff. We're peeling at patterns, at habits, uh, which can be emotional, they can be cultural. Uh, our social conditioning is a big one that we're peeling away. You know, our, our culture, whatever it is, whether you're in Turkey or you're in Dublin, uh, cultures are different, and those cultures tell us how to behave and what to do, but those cultures aren't always right. In fact, those cultures sometimes uh, give us messages that are quite problematic. But uh, eventually what we want to do is we want to work this idea of introspection, of peeling the onion, until it becomes an actual constant state of mind, a little mechanism that's always running in the back, always keep a watchful eye. It's kind of like a protector, you know? It's watching, it's making sure we're behaving in the way we've decided we want to behave. You know, we're talking about freedom here. We're not trying to uh, box ourselves in or uh, offer any kind of oppression to our thoughts. Quite the opposite. We're looking for freedom and spontaneity, all the yummy good stuff that we like about life. But it takes a little control because you got to control the rotten stuff. The, the good stuff can't shine forward if all this rotten stuff is always on our minds. If we, if we can't stop our states of anxiety, and we can't stop our, our minds from thinking endlessly and, and going on and on and on. So that's where a little bit of control comes in. Um, 
But at some point when you practice it, it becomes easy because the mechanism kind of takes over. And at this point, the onion starts to peel itself, that you develop a curiosity and, and an insight. And because you see the benefits of it, and you start to feel you start to feel good because you've you've gotten rid of a lot of the baggage that you're carrying around with. Your mind starts to like it, and your mind starts to uh, offer this or apply this method um, on its own, and that's wonderful. So, what are some of the concepts we can um, we can use introspection on? Uh, it, it's very famous in Buddhist teachings: the body and mind. And that includes everything. That's emotions and perception and thinking, uh, uh, habits and patterns of the body. More interesting yet are views and intentions. The way you look at the world, that's by far the most interesting out of all of them. But most people just accept their common model of reality. They don't ever think that it's a habit that I've been fed. You know, that people tell me, oh, the Big Bang goes off and that's, and we just accept it all. But they're accepted habits and patterns. When you dig into them, they become much more fascinating. Again, we have patterns, habits, free will, perceptions, uh, interpretations of reality. That's a fascinating one to look into. We've talked about that before, that we think that we're, we're perceiving a, the world as it really is, but we're only perceiving what the human eye can see what the human eye can hear, what the human eye can touch and feel, but also we can only perceive what the human eye can understand. There's so much information out there that we just can't perceive. So that's a fascinating thing. Uh, we can peel the onion on emotions, moods, feelings, reactivities, all kinds of traits, our likes, our dislikes, hopes and fears, social conditioning. You know the list. I got the whole list in the book. So I'd like to dig right into a little bit of practice. And first, let's get into some uh, instructions for peeling the onion. So for you, for those of you who are familiar with mindfulness practice, that's the same thing. That's what we're doing here. We're learning how to be more present, more aware, more watchful. Um, we're learning about ourselves. Uh, when you learn about yourself, especially in our sangha, we want to learn from the the largest uh, source possible. The, draw from the, the as much of the sources as you can. So not just from Buddhism. We want to study psychology. We want to study science, other religions. You know, the the Christian mystics have a lot of great stuff they to offer. But we want to be really uh, open minded to this and uh, learn about ourselves in all kinds of different contexts. So uh, that's really important. We don't want to be dogmatic uh, here. Uh, we want to become watchful of our intentions, our emotions, all of that good stuff. So let's start with level one. So I made this system into like a five level kind of system. And let's go over it. So level one is recognizing and noting patterns. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, this practice you can do in a formal way, sitting on a meditation cushion with an insight meditation, which we've talked about. So you can do it in a formal way. I can sit here on the couch right now, close my eyes in silence, and really dig in and look for things. But also the practice, and it should kind of be both. The practice is when you're out and about, you know, when you're working, there's just a little bit of a, of a piece of your mind that's focusing on this stuff and watching what you're doing when you're walking down the street. We want to get to the point where we always have a little bit of introspection going on. Now, that might sound kind of obnoxious, or it might sound like a little bit of effort, but the thing about it is once you start it and you get going a little bit, it just becomes kind of a habit. It becomes a constant thing, and you don't have to really worry about it. So I would recommend that. So at the beginning, we observe our thoughts and behaviors and patterns, and we are slowly honing or developing our skills of awareness. So at the beginning, you don't really have the greatest skills of awareness, probably. Um, 
and this is a technique that you slowly have to learn. The other one is you can, you always forget to practice it. So, you know, half the day goes by and you go, oh man, I haven't been introspective all day. So, and that's okay. That's another thing. You just have to get used to the practice itself. Um, but we slowly, uh, we slowly become more and more aware of our actions and more present. And then of course we, we uh, utilize noting which we, again, we've talked about before. Noting, making labels or mental notes is a great way to focus the mind on things, right? So this can be as simple as kind of whatever you start to interact with, just kind of say it in your head, right? Uh, when, you, when you get up from your chair, walking, you know, when I'm starting work, working, you can just kind of note them as they come up. Uh, and also this is true about emotions and things. You're having a conversation with someone and they say something that offends you. If you note that emotion and you say anger or you say offended, um, it draws a lot of reason and logic to it. And it really helps you deal with the emotion itself because the time it takes for you to note it, it creates a little bit of a space in there between the stimuli and the reaction, and it just lets a little wisdom shine in, right? It allows you a little bit of space to apply some skills. So, so the simple act of noting something, you'll find your emotional reactions are, are lessened and you're more emotionally stable. So it's a great practice to do, and I think you'll find that it is quite amazing. It has a profound effect on on people. Uh, if you want to read more about noting, it's in both of the texts, uh, Meditation Basics and Mindfulness Basics, especially Mindfulness Basics. It goes into a, a deep uh, account there of, of exactly what noting is and how you do it. Um, level two is investigating and noting causes and results of our patterns. So where level one is just noticing the pattern itself, the emotion, the intention, all of a sudden this, this thought of ice cream pops up and you note it, desire. Right there, that usually stops me from getting the ice cream. Well, at least I'll tell you, I'll tell you that. And, uh, but it really works well, whatever you're, whatever you're kind of going about. If you're sitting there being uh, procrastinating and you note it, lazy, sometimes that'll get me right up off the couch. So level one is, is noting the, uh, the activity itself or what arises. Level two is different. We're going beyond that, and we're, we're trying to look at the causes and results. You know, where did, that, where did that cause for that desire to come up? What triggered me to want to get some ice cream? And uh, if I don't get the ice cream, what did I use to get that result? So we're, we're paying more attention to how it arises and how it, how it uh, dissipates. So, and those two are primarily mindfulness practice. This practice becomes fascinating when we get to the next level, level three. Now this uh, we don't talk about, the levels three, four, and five we don't talk about in mindfulness basics. This is the really interesting part of this text. Now, this we start to notice that with the discovery of the space between stimuli and reaction. This is quite exciting. Usually people will discover this in meditation, in calm abiding meditation, where they'll start to notice the space, and of course, we're trying to create that space between thoughts. So you know in, in meditation, we focus on the breath, and we try to keep our awareness there, but eventually our mind wanders off to thought, and, and a thought comes up and we start to think about it, and then we bring our mind back. But slowly you start to really understand that whole mechanism, and you start to see the space between your thoughts, even when not meditating, even when uh, working or walking around. Uh, but the space is very small. With, as you notice it, and as you become aware of it, you can start to make that space longer. And that's what we're trying to do in a uh, mindfulness practice. So here, the very first thing you do is you observe that space between the thoughts. You don't have to do anything with it. You just observe it, 
And if you can, you can try to stretch it out a little. Now, level four is a quality that many people aren't aware of, that when thoughts and thinking arises, most of us think we're directly attached to that quality or, or to say we react spontaneously to the quality that's there with no kind of a choice involved. And in meditation, you, you very quickly learn that that's not true at all. With this practice and with starting to see that space between the stimuli and the reaction and creating a bigger space, you often start to see something else. You start to see, oh my gosh, I actually chose that response. So a stimuli comes up, somebody calls me short, which, which I'm not, and then the reaction is anger. But when you look at it deeper, you start to, you start to see that little space where you, you say, wow, I actually said to myself, this is the appropriate place to get angry, and I became angry. That's, this is quite fascinating, but it's a system where we weigh it out. And oftentimes I see my own mind, I, I, I almost see like, where did my father get mad? Or where did my peers get mad? Like if someone's insulting me, they would reach a certain level. And then I would decide, okay, now they've gone too far. Now it's appropriate for me to be angry, right? That's the mechanism. But what's interesting that mechanism is underlying all kinds of other stuff too, even happiness and desire. And it's a, it's a fascinating mechanism. And when you start to realize that subconsciously and as a habit and a pattern, it's not free will, that you're choosing your emotions, then your relationship to your emotions changes a lot. Because you, and, and rarely do you get much control. Like even though I watch it, I'll get angry, and then later I go, damn, I was watching it, I saw it arise, and I still chose it, and later on I'll, I'll yell at myself for it. But I do get better at it, and I find myself at certain times that I did do it right. I say, oh, good job. You really, you really saw it coming, and you sidestepped it, and you didn't get angry. So, yeah, we practice, and you know, if you can get a little bit better, your life improves a little bit, so that's easy. So, that's uh, level four is discovering your role in the choice because most of us don't feel that something happens and we instantly get mad and why did we get mad because this happened no you chose to get mad and of course level five is the most fascinating of anyone of any of them and that's learning to transcend this reactionary behavior. So this habit of a uh, pattern of, of, of reacting, we call reactionary behavior, one that we don't have any control over. And I just explained the mechanism on how we do it. Once we're aware of it and we can watch it, we slowly gain the ability to say, no, I'm not going to do it, right? It arises. And, and if, if you're lucky and you're practicing well, you could say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have ice cream. I'm going to have an apple instead, which is not nearly as satisfying, I must say. <laughs> but it's healthy. So, but uh, when, you start getting, uh, when you start controlling reactionary behavior, on a serious note, a whole new world opens up to you. It's extraordinary. Um, when you start to control reactionary behavior, you start to get into objective distance and you start to abide in stillness and you finally feel like you're in control of yourself and it's so easy to just let things slide like i'm thinking so many cases in my life where usually it's, it's always verbal right somebody says something and you think you should respond right away and if somebody asks you a question we always think we have to answer but soon you start to realize there's so much you could just let slide by and you start to watch life instead of feel like you're obliged to participate in everybody else's minutia of, uh, of, you know, just the trivial stuff that everybody talks about. And they draw you in and you have to have an opinion. 
what do you think of the Kardashians? And I'm a monk, what am I supposed to say to them? But they draw you into it all. So when you start to see it as the way it is and you can start controlling reactionary behavior, you start to watch life like, like it's an extraordinary movie that you can, uh, you can just watch. A movie where you can smell and taste and hear and all of that. Uh, for me, uh, reacting starts to become just like a hassle. Like it's something that I don't have the time and energy for anymore. When people want to engage me and draw me into something, it's like, oh, do I have to? <laughs> do, I, do I really have to get into all this? So, um, yeah, you start to see it as all. It's just a, a whole bunch, like a big soap opera that you don't need to be a, a part of. But there's so many cases that you'll find when you practice this of how many decisions you don't have to make of how many times you don't have to react that, hey, if I don't react to it, it just drifts away, like steam coming off of a pond in the morning. You know, if I don't reach out and touch the steam, it just drifts away and dissipates. It doesn't have to be a part of my life. So that's my teaching on reactionary behavior. Hey, let's look at an example. I give an example in the book that I think is pretty good on anger because – I have so many angry friends. I thought it would be, I'm joking, kind of. <laughs> I'm not talking about you, Karen. I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about everybody else, not you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, oh, so we have this example of anger. So, uh, so the, the practice of peeling the onion, you can apply it in different ways. One is just open observation. Peeling the onion can be just, going about your day and just watching all the things that happen, not directed at any one thing, but looking just at everything, watching what arises, learning about each thing that goes on. That's like an open style of it. Uh, another way we can practice it is to, to look directly at a quality. So say I'm Karen and I have great anger problems. <laughs> and um, so I might take that quality and say to myself, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with that today. And so what I do is I go about my day and I simply watch and look for uh, anger when it arises. But it's important that we look at the quality as a spectrum. Uh, again, we've talked about this. Uh, our qualities, we really need to see them as spectrums and not single qualities. When we talk about anger, we shouldn't have this one idea of anger like, you know, throwing something. Anger starts with very, very mild irritation. And then at the other end, goes all the way to some kind of blind rage. So we have to recognize all of our qualities in all of their different uh, levels on the spectrum. So when you're watching anger, watch for irritation, anything, all aspects of it. And you're watching that uh, throughout your day. Anything that starts to annoy you, some anger starts as annoyance and irritation and gradually grows into something more. Others just come right in, right? And then uh, you'll also find that some angers, you can see that you actually chose to be angry, like when you're insulted. Somebody will go too far, and then you say, okay, that's the point. I'm going to react angrily now to that person. But then other times, it's hard to see the choice because like sometimes when you hurt yourself, you ever hurt yourself and get angry? Often you hurt your hand doing something. It, you, know, you don't get angry, just, oh, I hurt my hand. But other times, I don't know why, but you hurt yourself and it just throws you into anger. So, so these qualities are complex. You have to figure out how they work for yourself. Um, so we're looking for that anger as it arises. On level two, uh, we identify it and note it. Yeah, and you can notify it by all the subtle terms of anger, annoyance, irritation, anger. Uh, it's up to you. Once we get to level three, uh, we want to recognize the subtle space that exists between the stimuli and the anger. Try to see that space from what happened and at what point did you really get angry. And just look at it, try to ex explore it a little bit, see if you can expand it. At level four, we're looking for uh, was there a place that I chose to get angry? We're looking for that. And, and it doesn't have to be just anger. Uh, at what point did I decide to give in to the desire or decide to give in to lust 
Or at what point did I tell myself it was okay to be greedy or selfish? Selfish is a good one. At what point did I decide to not share my ice cream without, some, with, without someone else? Um, so that's what we're doing at level four, is we're looking for that decision. At level five, we're trying to uh, recognize uh, the moment and the moment of choice and, and transcend it and, and to see, is there a point where uh, first looking in the past saying, was there a point that I could have said no? And then also as it arises in the current moment, being able to say no and, and, and pat yourself on the back. Say, ah, I did it. I saw it coming. I saw the decision and I said, no, I'm not doing it. So that's our example. And this is just a, a short, sweet practice. This is one that I usually don't do formally. This is just something that's constantly running in the background for me. But I think for new people at it, it's good to do it at, at the beginning as a formal practice where you're really aware of it. You know, Pick a quality in the morning and watch that throughout the day. It really helps you to kind of get started. So we got some tools for you. Uh, I'd like to stop there and, and see if anybody has any questions because we just covered the application of it. Anybody have any questions about how to apply it? Did I, uh, did I make it really clear? And I'm gonna watch to see if any of my anger arises at your questions and if I can stop it. Yeah, we're being mindful right now, aren't we? Yeah? Don't be shy. I find I always have to give time for people to talk. Okay, I don't have any questions. All I have is thumbs up and people holding up signs saying, you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Uh, hey, uh, let's, let's talk about the aspiration. So you know me, I am a big fan of these aspirations and affirmations. I call them prayers, but they're not really prayers. We're not praying to somebody. We're praying that I hope I get over this stuff. We're praying to ourselves. So uh, you can recite this one in the morning. It's part of our morning, uh, our morning prayers on YouTube. And for some of you that don't know it, all the stuff that's on YouTube and more is on the website. So you don't have to keep going to YouTube. You can download them on uh, my website and just have them on your phone. So if you don't have internet connection, I always make everything available because I remember all the times I wanted to download something off YouTube and I couldn't figure it out. And I had to download a YouTube download program. You remember those? And it only works for 14 days. And oh, I said never again. So I made it easy for everybody. Okay, let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and read this for you guys. This is the Peeling the Onion Aspiration. Today I use, utilize introspection to uncover my true nature. Practicing noting to recognize my patterns, habits, and their triggers. I do this to expose my many layers of conditioning in the pursuit of mental freedom. Today, I'll realize and expand the space between stimuli and my reactions while developing control over my conscious and subconscious choices. Today, I transcend reactivity by abiding in stillness and float above worldly concerns by maintaining an objective distance. And the last two lines of that is actually what I do. I imagine myself floating above the chaos and busyness of the world and uh, in, a, in a state of stillness. It works very well for me. And I can still interact with the world, but I'm not necessarily such a part of it. I'm not drawn in so deeply. And of course, we have a three breath meditation one of my favorites. On this one, we were going to say present aware, and our last one is introspective. And as all of you know, what I usually do is I just keep the first two the same. Present and aware just work in every situation. And then according to the practice, I change the third, the third word. So let's go ahead and try this. Uh, on the inhale, we'll say present. At the top of the inhale, we'll say aware. And on the exhale, we'll say introspective. And let's take our first breath. You can search your second breath. 
and your third breath. So my friends have found that they love doing the three breath meditation, which of course I always have said it's my favorite. I do it all day long and it is wonderful, especially with the mantra. And you can play with the mantra. I used to do one, I used to say, aware, aware of something and confident or something, aware peaceful and confident. But uh, you know, any kind of qualities you're looking to, uh, to build you can just drop them in that mantra. And boy, does it really help. It's just pre reprogramming your brain, putting a little extra code in there. Um, and our next section we're going to talk about is what to expect from this practice. Um, so in the book, I talk about that, you know, ultimately, we're just trying to come to terms with our internal and external processes. We, we use this just to understand ourselves, to see how we work. And uh, as we become uh, more accomplished at this, you're able to go deeper and deeper. At the beginning, you'll start with obvious patterns. You know, I, I always put my right shoe on first, or uh, why do I always leave the toilet seat up at night when I go to the bathroom or something? But, but ultimately, they get deep, and, and that's when that's when the cool stuff begins, when you start to uncover patterns and you go, wow, I never knew I did that before. Or you see patterns that you, you, you attain from other people. Like you saw parents talk about this, that they, they find themselves sounding like their parents. And that becomes really cool. And what's cool about it is that as you gain insight into them, you gain control over them that awareness does bring you the control and that in control allows you to start working with them, removing unproductive habits, unskillful habits, and incrementally we get better and we gain a level of freedom. And we're all about freedom. I think, uh, I think my whole path from before I was a monk into being a monk and a teacher, I think you could just sum up the whole thing by freedom. When I was a teenager, I was a handful. I didn't like school. I didn't like people telling me what to do. I've been, I've been uh, craving freedom ever since I can remember. So, and I just never stopped. I just, I became a little better at it. I think instead of fighting the world, I found how to gain it uh, in, in real ways. And when we're talking about freedom, of course, we're, the, the real freedom that we're trying to gain is mental freedom. Uh, external freedom, I'm all for it. You know, I like, to, I like to have freedom from all the injustice and everything in the world. But the internal freedoms are the real, real ones that we're shooting for. Freedom from fear and ignorance and anxiety, obsession, greed, envy, pride, conceit, hatred, self-doubt, self-criticism. That's the big one, right? To, to finally make friends with yourself and stop doubting everything you make and support yourself. That's something so many of us really lack, our lack of confidence. You know, that's a great one to be freed from. And of course, afflicted emotions and uncontrollable thinking. Uh, to, be, to be freed from the, uh, the thinking process where it just thinks anything it wants to and, and, and puts you into a roller coaster of emotions all through the day. That has in so many ways uh, stopped for me. And I can't tell you what a lovely sensation is to wake up every day and not have that. To wake up and go to bed and feel roughly the same throughout the day. Greatest feeling in the world. So uh, you can get that through here. Uh, the one last thing I want to talk about with that is um, in so many ways, I think the Buddha probably emphasized this kind of practice more than anything else. When people think of Buddhism, they always think about meditation. But the Buddha's first teaching on meditation was actually teaching on mindfulness. He didn't even call it meditation. So his very first teaching of any kind of introspection or anything was the practice of mindfulness, which this is a practice of. And he claimed that without this uh, aspect of introspection, of watching yourself, of learning about yourself, of developing yourself and freeing yourself, 
liberation is not possible. Enlightenment is not possible. This is the way we awaken. This is the way we, we reach enlightenment, not by other means. So I want to stress the importance of this practice in Buddhism. This is the practice, right? Okay, I've made that pretty clear. Um, you know, a couple of ways uh, I talk about in the book of working with patterns that have worked well for me, I'd like to share. One of them is uh, the practice of envisioning the scientific model of patterns and habits. This one works great for me. So I'm not a scientist, but I'll tell you briefly what my scientist friend shared with me, how, you know, patterns and habits in our mind are just, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, Carl? They're, they're neural pathways in our brains. But it's actually like a physical structure that's going on. And pathways and habits are created like little, little bridges, little pathways in our brains. And for some reason, when I, when I actually visualize that and I imagine it, it seems so much easier to work with. I guess you see it clearly, right? There's a, there's a clarity to it. And in the book, I talk about it being like, like, for, like paths in the forest. You know, so you, you have a regular path that you walk to school every day with no grass. And to create a new path, all you have to do is start walking in a different part of the forest. It's, it's a little difficult at first, right? There's, there's no kind of way to see where you're going. But the more you walk on that, the more the grass dies away. And before you know it, you have an actual trail, a nice full path that's easy to follow. And what happens to the, the other path? The more you stay off of it, the more the grass grows back and it disappears. This is how we work with, with our patterns. So I imagine that. So when I have a choice, so it's like uh, uh, ice cream or an apple, which one do I want for dessert? I have a really strong pathway to that ice cream. I would say I, I've probably, it's probably about a foot or two deep that path from walking on it so many times. But at the beginning, instead of saying, do I want ice cream or do I want apples? I think about that pathway and say, which path do I, do I want to preserve? What habit do I want to enforce? And so the idea is as, the, as much as I can to stay off the ice cream path and go down the apple path, it'll be easier and easier to choose an apple. And it works. It's really true. The Buddha talked about desire as being like salt water. The more you have it, the more you want it. And you'll find in this practice of peeling the onion, you start to gain much more insight into the way your mind works. I see this happening in my mind. If I have ice cream one night, guaranteed I want it the next night. And, and if I go a few nights without eating it, then it becomes easier and easier to say no. It's, a, it's, a really, it's something you can actually witness for yourself. So for me, I like to kind of look, look and actually imagine my brain and what am I working with? And No, let's go this way with my brain. And that works. Hopefully it'll work for you also. The other one uh, is, um, is understanding choices as patterns. So again, in the book, I had this story that I'm walking home one day and I see a McDonald's and I have the urge for a fast food f frenzy fiesta. I'm going to go to McDonald's and supersize myself. And then, um, but then the thought comes, oh no, Tarpa, it'd be a lot better. Why don't you go home and make a healthy meal? You'll feel better tomorrow. And then at one point I just realized it's, we don't, we shouldn't be making decisions for what we want. We should be thinking about what patterns we want to create. So again, by going to McDonald's, it creates that pathway. It makes that trail stronger and guaranteed I'm going to be drawn to that for the next few days, where if I go home, I create that pattern stronger. So then to me, it came down to the way we look at our choices. So instead of saying, what do I feel like eating, which is what most of us say, we should be saying to ourselves, and this is true with all of our choices, we should be saying, what dietary patterns do I want to encourage? Because we're creatures of habit, and we talked about this on our last teachings, we truly are. When you start doing this practice, you just start to see more and more how all of the aspects of your life are patterns. It's amazing. Your likes, your dislikes, your friendship, the way you feel about people, 
come, can come into patterns. It's quite startling. Again, I'd like to say patterns and habits are not a problem. This is simply the way our mind works. It's not good or bad. It's just the way our mind works. Now, you can use them for an advantage or a disadvantage. You could follow the old unproductive habits with no awareness, which doesn't seem to work. Everybody, you just fall into bad habits. Or you could bring awareness to it, and then you can bring your skills in and start to adapt, adopt good patterns, good habits that you know lead to productive things in our lives, which leads to a better life. So that's what we're talking about. But we don't want to demonize patterns and habits. It's an extraordinary function. Our minds are not capable of, in their present state anyways, of being aware of everything in our lives. The way we, our minds work is we prioritize things and we're able to, to put things into patterns so they can take care of themselves, allowing our mind to do other things. That's how you can talk on the phone and stir, still stir soup on the, on the stove so the soup, soup doesn't spurn, burn, but you can still talk on the phone. So uh, our patterns and habits are remarkable. We, we need to fully appreciate them, and, but use them to their best advantage. Oh, that was encouraging. Sir, I have a question for you. I have an answer. Go ahead. So you are telling before uh, this topic, uh, just uh, you are telling maybe lack of confidence or maybe another things you are getting this triggerness sometimes like some people, if uh, people are saying something to you, you are feeling that is uh, making you down or maybe you are getting anger, different, different uh, negative emotions, right? But how do you decide what kind of uh, negative uh, um impact you are getting uh, like uh, you sometimes i felt like i will if anyone is asking me out of boundary questions like um, if i i am feeling that is more personal i will feel more emotional but i don't know it is uh, because of uh, uh, lack of confidence or maybe it is insecurity i don't know what is the behind that so is there any technique to find out why i am feeling there is. Very, uh, low like a That's a great question. And the mechanism to it is this practice. Every single one of us, all of these qualities, where do I get offended? Where do I um, get intrigued by something? Those levels are different for every one of us. Some of them are cultural. You know, you might find that certain cultures seem to get angry faster than others, or other cultures maybe are more greedy than others. These qualities can, can be cultural, but so much of the time, as you can imagine, like in, in your uh, country, in Turkey, there's, uh, you know, all kinds of different people. Some people are easily offended, some people aren't. So those are different among every single one of them. Ultimately, you're the one who has to decide. But generally, we make that decision within the framework of the environment we're in. You know, we'll base it on our friends and what's appropriate in our culture, right? But that's up to you. So by practicing peeling the onion, you watch those qualities. You, you, you know, the first thing is you might not even be aware of a certain level where you decide to get angry. You know, I, I'm sure you know it's there, but you might not know that much about it. By peeling the onion and using introspection, you start to kind of really nail this stuff down. And you go, ah, there's that point, you know? And slowly you start to learn about yourself and you, you see it and then you can decide for yourself. You have the freedom of choice, but ultimately only you can decide, you know, where to be. I'm a monk, so culturally that holds me at a different place. I can't get angry like most people. You know, they say, look at that angry monk. He's a terrible monk. So there are certain things, you know, uh, uh, whether you're a parent or grandparent or a certain type of job, you're held to a different level. You know, a monk, I can't, you know, ever use any kind of violence or I shouldn't raise my voice. So my job holds me to certain levels, but every job and every person and every situation and that situation changes all the time. You'll find that uh, you constantly have to assess that. But the way we get that knowledge and the way we do it is through this practice. 
Hmm. Great. Then yeah. We come there. <laughs> uh, and and he and some advice for everybody. If this sounds monumentous or this like this big thing, it's not. You start really slowly. You start with just a little bit of intrigue. There's there's no hurry. If you can just gain a little bit more awareness into your behaviors and your patterns, you'll gain also that much control. And that much control equals that much freedom. And usually that much freedom will equal that much happiness. So it's incremental. You don't have to just, I, I'm giving you a full practice here, but for you, you know, to take some time and just look at level one, these, aren't, you, these don't have to be practiced all together. Uh, ultimately at the end, all the levels just get squished into one practice. I don't, when I practice it, I don't think about these levels. The whole thing's just one apparatus, one method that I apply. So take it slow, have fun. Don't worry about, uh, don't worry about it. If you can get a little bit of this in, the, in your life, you'll improve a little bit. And again, I have to say what we're talking about is mental freedom. I want you guys to be free. I want you guys to make choices because they're the choices that you really want, not choices that were just patterns that other people you heard and you were uh, influenced by and you just decided to do it. So that's what we're shooting for. And we're coming up on two hours. So I want to, I think that that's all I have to say. How about we do some questions and answers? Oh, I have one thing for you guys. I know my friends love their pictures. You guys love your pictures. You know, everybody told me, they said, can you put your text on audio? Because we don't like to read. Everybody's like moving away from reading. And, and anyway, so audio and pictures is how we want to study. So I actually found a, a meme for peeling the onion. Life is like an onion. You peel it off one layer at a time, and sometimes you weep. And there's a truth to that. Sometimes we peel the onion and we gain control and awareness. But sometimes you peel it and you, you know, there's things that are, can be a little unnerving, you know, insecurities sometimes are there. We have to be brave and try to take a good look at ourselves. Um, does anybody know what the, uh, what the remedy to it? How do we stop from crying when we peeling the onion? Anybody? That's a good question for Carl if he's not out feeding his birds. Karen, please tell me. Make a change. Oh, lovely. I thought you were going to say three breath meditation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my, uh, anybody else? My choosing not to cry simply. <laughs> uh, very well. And, and this is true. A lot of people don't know that. Like people say to me, you can't choose to be happy. You know, things that, and boy, are they wrong. You can actively make up your mind to feel certain ways. Maybe they don't have the control, but when you've been meditating and when, you know, when you've been working with your mind, it's pretty easy to just generate qualities. Now, there could be an argument to how genuine are those, but then you could have the same argument mm -hmm. in general about how genuine are any of our qualities. They all come from patterns and habits and things like that. But yeah, we can, show, we can choose to not weep, can I interrupt at that stage? Yeah. Because I was going to ask what you think about fake it until you make it. Does it also work? It does. And, and that, that's a technique that we use in Buddhism. So the idea of the, if some of you know the idea of the bodhisattva, the, kind of like a Buddhist saint. Uh, bodhisattva means the one who has the mind of awakening. And so it's a, 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 of course, the way it sounds, it's a level of attainment of a, of a really great practitioner. But we have contrived and uncontrived, and it's kind of like fake and unfake, you know. So the idea is that you say the prayers, yeah, I want to benefit all people. I only care about others and not myself. And at the beginning, you think, oh, you know, that's not true at all. I really want stuff for myself. But at a certain point in practice, all of a sudden, it's like one day you say, wow, I really meant it this time. And it surprises you. So, yeah, fake it till you make it can work. Uh, you know, funny things like psychologists have done uh, uh, research on fake smiling and how the mechanics of that actually improve people's uh, feelings. So that's quite remarkable, isn't it? 
we are a mysterious organism? Yeah, good question. And I think a lot of times, I mean, even becoming a monk, I think when you're a new monk, so much of it is, you know, you, you try your best to kind of hold that ground. But how, how good are you at the beginning? So I think most of us in our jobs, we kind of do that. And yeah, good question. I have a comment on smiling. Oh, yes. So, uh, there was this uh, small puzzle. There are many uh, faces. And you have to uh, select the ones that are smiling. <laughs> so I was doing that. So I started, I started to smile while I'm doing that. So it become much more easier because while I'm smiling, I also detect the smiling faces. So it's really, I think, uh, good. So when you are smiling in the day, so you <laughs> catch the good stuff more than that. Yeah, more I than can't that. stop smiling as you say it. And if, if anybody's uh, seen our seven list, uh, our checklist for meditation, uh, number three is smiling. We smile when we meditate to bring joy into it. So yeah, yeah they, they do it with each other. Yeah. Any other questions of all my lovely friends? So nice to be with you today, by the way. I so much love uh, the teachings. Uh, there's a chance that this will be our last teaching before I leave Dublin and head out. But there were two requests on two very small papers. Uh, one of them was in the, uh, the Four Gifts, and one is on um, uh, mental discipline. And they're very small. I think they're only like a couple pages each. Maybe we could squeeze those in somewhere, and then uh, that would be great. And then I'm headed for Turkey. I think everybody knows that. Just can't wait uh, to see Istanbul again. It's the greatest city in the world. <laughs> Eat my simits and my Turkish tea, Turkish coffee. Lovely. Any other questions? And am I forgetting anything? I'm a forgetful monk. I'm always forgetting something. I had a chat thing. Somebody was chatting away, and I don't know how they, what they had to say. Oh. Okay, nothing there. And anyways, uh, hey, let's then with everything done, let's go ahead and say our uh, our prayer for the end. Uh, we have our altruistic prayer. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. You guys are just wonderful. Thank you for supporting my work. I surely hope all this rambling and babbling that I do somehow has a positive effect in all of your lives. That's my only wish. Uh, you know, I learned a whole bunch of stuff when I was in the monastery for all those years, handcuffed to the walls. And um, my hope is just that some of that wisdom that those smart people had trickles out from time to time, and I can help some people with their lives. With that said, may all of you be healthy, may all of you be prosperous, may all of you be well. May you be present, free of past regret and future worry. May you abide in constant appreciation, which is a source of great joy and contentment. May you all realize your true nature and the true nature of reality, which is awakening. And how do we recognize our, how do we realize our true nature and the true nature of reality? by peeling that onion day by day, layer by layer, as we're weeping. <laughs> okay. Uh, and lastly, this is the uh, last teaching of this series on peeling the onion. And if anybody would like to contribute to my work, if you find some value of it and you want to keep this big fat monk eating some more food, uh, feel free to make a donation on my website. It would be greatly appreciated. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>